Welcome to the English Wine Collections podcast. My name is Guy, I am the curator at the English Wine Collection, and in the following podcasts, I'll be sitting down and chatting to industry experts on all things wine. To kick things off, I sat down with John Apthorpe, the former head of Majestic Wine, and we discussed his career history to date. John has had easily one of the biggest influences on the wine trade within England, and as you'll learn, it all came down to a uh, A gentle nudge from his wife saying, go out and get a job. I hope you enjoy it and we'll be in touch with more soon. If it's possible, um, Mr. Atfor, can you tell me where it began and and how you got involved in this? I was in the back end of career in the Navy. And when I came out, I got a job um, at Chateau Palmer in 1955, picking the grapes. I worked, picked the grapes. Uh, I worked in the Shay, I made the wine, I made Eau de Vie there. I was probably over there for about six, seven weeks. My job, and I had another friend, our job was to follow up, particularly on a Friday, because what they would do, the pickers would miss half a, half a row because they could go back there on Saturday, pick the grapes, and make their own wine. And uh, the, the people there didn't like it. And, of course, the French pickers didn't particularly like us either. Because, But um, the chap who was down there was a chap called Guy Salisbury-Jones, and he was the very first English person in England to plant a vineyard over here, and that was on the Isle of Wight. This is not even on England itself, then. it's on the Isle of Wight. No, and that was in... He did it, I think, if you look it up, I think it was... 1955 or 1956. Oh, wow, as early as that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I, I thought from the research and what we discovered, it was, it was the 70s, you know. Very no, no, 70s, no, no, no. Uh, now, Guy Salisbury Jones did this in, if you look him up, I'm sure it's 55. And the Isle of Wight as well, mm. on, on mainland mm. England. Have you tried any of those wines? No. <laughs> <laughs> it would be interesting I to see. I was very, very lucky because 55 was a particularly good year. And um, the Chateau Palmer uh, was better than Chateau Margo, which it adjoins. Okay. Uh, and I had quite a lot in my cellar at one time, but I, I'm afraid I drank it. <laughs> so it's the job I had there, which was quite frightening, um, when you finish, when they pumped all the wine out of the enormous barrels, I had to climb down in a bathing suit and get rid of all the leaves and things. <laughs> and you took a candle down with you. And if the candle gutted, you got out quick because it, it built up of CO2. Yeah, yeah, of course. So, <laughs> I had no idea you'd, you'd been that involved with the vineyard. Oh, yes. As you say, that's the, the whole process that's when of I making started, wine. That's when I started buying wine. Oh, wow. I don't suppose you have any of those original wines that you made back then, do you? No, I'm not sure if I have. Probably not. But um, I bought wine every year. The biggest problem with building up a cellar is you buy it and you drink it. You've got to get past the stage <laughs> where you're buying. And I only buy in good years. Um, I might go four years or five years not buy anything at all. Wow. And then when you get a really good year, I will really hammer it. So... Do you go, still go to lots of trade tastings then, I presume, if you're able to know which years are good, or do you just go on your well, knowledge from I, the previous? Well, unfortunately, not so much now. I had the same as you. I had major heart problems and open heart surgery and valves replaced and God knows what else. Oh, it's fun, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. I, I had no yeah, idea. Wow, no, that's okay. Like, no, some bloody fool was going to do a TV for me. Ah, yes. Yeah. Okay. And it all went wrong. And they punctured another valve. And, oh, my God. And then I was ended up in Bart's. Very luckily, the professor there at Bart's and my third son, who's a consultant, they both were senior registrars there for seven years. Oh, so wow. as soon as I walked in with Miles to see him, he said, Miles! And I got operated on the next day. Oh, they're, they're wonderful there, aren't they? Oh, they're fantastic. Absolutely wonderful. Well, the professor yeah. there was, um, 
I, my one passion in life is shooting pheasants. Well, I did grouse. I've still got grouse, grouse balls, but... But birds, we have to just make sure it's just birds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and he is a very keen um, shot. So I said to him, when we had the interview before, I said, if you can sort me out, I promise you one of the best days shooting you'll ever remember. And what, around here? Or? Yes. Oh, it's, wow. I think it's a place called Hexton, just the other side, near Lily. And it's one of the fine... It's, no one knows about it, but it's um, where the old glaciers finished and you've got these, they're not very wide, valleys, very steep valley. You stand at the bottom and they drive them over the top, almost out of shot. It's fantastic. Sorry. So did no, you no, 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 Did he come with you shooting? He's coming. It's yeah. the, I, this was this when he did me in December. Oh, so we recently. don't, he'll okay. be shooting with me. In about October. Do you still enjoy drinking? No, very much. You don't find any, any very effects much. of what's happening? No, very much. I'm the exact same. Still really enjoy it. Obviously, you have to be careful. I never drink during the day. Yeah. I always drink at night. Yeah. Um, and, well, you can see what I've got <laughs> in the cellar. Uh, yes, we did. Yes. <laughs> I'm very jealous. Well, I'll be honest. <laughs> As I think most people are. Okay, so if you don't mind, I'd love to go back to as we were just discussing on where it started. Yeah, and, well, that's, and how- that's where it started. Then in 1963, I joined a club called the October Club. Now, these were people either in the city or in insurance, and we met the first Monday of every month, other month, and someone had to provide the wines and talk about them. And we had three masters of wine in it. Uh, no bottle of wine then could cost more than a pound. <laughs> and the reason we, uh, the first Monday of the month, uh, was the the restaurants were always very quiet. Yeah, of but course. we could do a super deal. So, I well, I'm still a member of it, but most of them died off. But um, do you know Patrick Grubb? He's not off the top of my head, no. No, Patrick Grubb was the first chairman of the Masters of Wine. He was in it. There were three or, three or four of them. And I must admit, I learned a hell of a lot about wine from them all and drank some very interesting wines. At the end, they were the captains of industry. <laughs> so the rule about a pound a bottle went. And sure. We were drinking some very good stuff. I love this idea of, of you all meeting up, and it, it's it's almost like you're the uh, it's the government body of the wine that all started with you lot, and then you, you've gone off and done yeah. your own things. There's such a wonderful imagery going off yeah. in my head now. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that obviously has had quite a, a big impact on yes. you, and, and and led you through. I mean, wh- what did you take from that to, to progress forward with? Uh, basically, I I learned learned about wine really at different places. I mean, Patrick Grubb was the chap who ran the Stellenbosch auctions in South Africa every year, and I got some marvellous wines through him. Um, no. And then, of course, I ha- I'm working not in the wine trade at all. Um, I started this firm, the frozen food firm, BJAM, and um, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, and at the end of... After 20 years, I was getting bored. We had 10,000 employees. I had factories all over the place. I had 400 and something stores in the UK. I wow. owned Victor Valley of the supermarkets. Um, and I really was bored to death. Anyways, thank God, Malcolm Walker of Iceland came on. and There was quite a nasty bidding war, which I stood back from because, frankly, I wanted to lose we did by 0.1%. <laughs> so I'm suddenly out of work at 55. And my wife said to me shortly after, I married you for better or worse, but not for lunch. Go and get a job. <laughs> so I thought, I've always been interested in wine. So that's when I, um, I, I first of all bought a small firm called, um, uh, what was it called? I can't remember. And then I stalked Majestic Wine. And um, 
So what do you mean by stalked? I tried to buy it. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Oh, and wow. eventually, uh, after, they lost 20 million quid in two years. Wow. <laughs> and I eventually got them all together, and there was Kleinwalk Benson owned 30%, Sharps in Birmingham, they owned 30% and spread out. And I said, I'll buy it from you. And they had about, I think, 12 lawyers, and I had mine, and just went on and on and on. And I said, <clears throat> at the end of the meeting, I said to my lawyer, Tony, you've got, um, you've got my uh, power of attorney. I said, my son is getting married tomorrow, and I'm off. If this meeting is not closed by five o'clock, walk away. And I turned around to his lawyers. I said, I'm, I'm a great, greatly impressed with lawyers, but I can't stand your company. And I just remind you, uh, if, if we don't agree it, no one's going to get paid here. Bye. <laughs> and I drove up the motorway. And, keep, and eventually they phoned and said, Tony phoned and said, we've got a deal. And I said, right, I want all the director's offices locked. I want the computers. And I'll see them on Monday morning and decide what we're going to do. Because I discovered they were running this thing into receivership so they could buy it back themselves. Oh, I see. Oh. Ah. And the chairman of it was a, uh, a villain. Uh, and uh, at the end of it, I said to him, you know, you, you've got to go. And he said, well, I'm not leaving unless you pay me all my expenses. And I said, you haven't spent any money in expenses this year. He said, doesn't matter. I'm entitled to X thousands of pounds expenses. And I thought, I'm, this is, so I paid him out. Okay. And I've watched his career because he was a professional uh, on, I think he was on the Guinness board. He was on all sorts of things. And every company he went to virtually went bust. So I started I started with about three or four stores. And in it, there was this very small firm up in, called Wharfside in the Midlands, which was a retail off license. Really didn't fit what I wanted to do. So I said, this son of mine who just got married, I said liquidate the sock, um, sell the premises, and fire the people. And he did. I paid 4.2 million for Majestic. Right. And I got 4.2 back from this. So I got Majestic for nothing. I was just about to say, there can't be much left, yeah. No. Well, we, and then I had the big problem because Majestic didn't rate us at all, um, all the staff. So they all came out on strike. And it was a bad time because there wasn't any other work about. So after about 10 days, they went back and they realised we knew what we were, well, I knew what I was doing. I, you know, I've always been a retailer. So we, when I took it over, we lost 600,000 the first year. The next year, I turned it round and we made 1.6 million. And then from there on, three years later, I floated it. Okay, so, so, so sorry, let me just, just interject there because that's just quite amazing. You went from negative 600,000 to a plus 1.6, so 2.2 million effective turnaround. In a nutshell, how did you do that? <laughs> Is that Basically, uh, I made, made sure the biggest thing with a retailer is no good. You've got to have stock. Right, okay. So the stores were properly stocked. I paid the suppliers generously. In other words, I, I screwed down on price, but they got paid virtually immediately, which, you know, before uh, they'd been waiting six months for their money. Okay. And it turned it turned it round. I think that's a really interesting point you've made because obviously everybody wants to get paid. It's all part of being business. But by building that relationship with them going, you'll get your money on this date. You know, this is when you want it, I'll give it to you, etc. It will just snowball oh, from dear. there. Yeah. Because a lot of the people uh, supplying them in the past, I mean, they wouldn't supply them. They didn't know whether they were going to get paid or not. And I worked, I think I worked for the five, first five years. I didn't draw a penny. In fact, I lent them some money. When we floated, 
oh, yeah, I got my fatty back. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, and then we went from there onwards. So that's what I, and um, I never really, I was chairman of it, but I never really involved. I involved myself in fi finding new sites and everything else. Like that. But the actual buying of wines, I left to people who knew what was what. Because although I've got a reason palette, um, you know, the people we employed obviously had a much better one. Sure, of course. And um, it just grew and grew and grew. <laughs> I love that. It just grew and grew. <laughs> That's everybody's dream. So, so on that note, you were saying that you, where you you help specialise, you say was finding new science, etc. Mm. What what did you use as your basis for that? What was key to to finding a good location? Well, there's a thing called Goad, which gives you an analysis of incomes, uh, ages of people, uh, or you know something like that. Um, but I, I mean, when I had BJAM, I said we had over four hundred sites. I we knew I knew what I was doing then. Where to where to open your stores? You know, preferably going out of town with plenty of parking. You know, uh, so they come shop on the way back home. Okay, so it's not necessarily getting the, you don't the want walkers prime, in. Shall we say? No, they, you they, don't want prime prime sites. Yeah, well, of Can't course, the, the expense. Rent. Yeah, but then I think what's I think what works quite well about that as well that the the customer is very intentionally coming to you. Absolutely. They're getting in their car, they're driving to you to come and get these products, so mm. they they will therefore make it more worth their while as well as yours at the same point. Really and the other thing we did, I've always spent a fortune on training, Tra point. and we People. train all our yeah. staff, and within six months they've got to go and. Sit the uh, wine and spirits exam. West of course, yeah. Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you go into any of our stores, and they do know what they're talking about. Yeah, of course. And uh, that worked. And because you're expanding so much, you can promote from within, uh, which is very handy. Uh, you know, if if someone comes, they can see. You know, they can trainee manager, manager, area manager, going on that or then they can switch to the buying or they can switch to the property or switch to something else. That's a very good way of retaining staff because they'll obviously oh, see is. their career path, won't they? And the other thing I made sure, we had share incentives. So okay. when we floated, I mean, a lot of them, you know, it was a down payment on the house. I mean, I think now Majestic sells just over half online. Really? One of the questions that I, I'm quite interested to to approach with you and, and it's quite interesting that, that it's coming now after everything you just said is Brexit. Now forgive me if you're bored to death with it yes. as I know most people are and uh, to and fro uh, what are your thoughts if that's possible to sum well, up I, I, I certainly voted for it. As in leave sorry or leave, stay? Yeah leave. leave. Right okay. Uh, because I really don't like being told what to do. Okay, so, so you generally feel that the, the uh, European yeah. Council, as it were, is... Absolutely. Is right. Absolutely. Okay, so can I, you be specific with that? Would you mind? Yes, me? yes. Um, a long time ago, we brought some fabulous wine in from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe? Okay. And we... Grown were, in Zimbabwe. So. Grown, in, uh, grown right. bottled in Zimbabwe. And it came in and... Uh, we were told by the EC we couldn't sell it because they didn't recognise wine coming from Zimbabwe. Oh, God. Okay. So, crazy. Do you think that's because uh, they were worried about um, the standards of it? Because oh, no, there's no question about that. I think yeah. probably the French influence. But, um, but we couldn't, it wasn't recognised wine producers, so we couldn't bring it, couldn't sell it. How irritating. Crazy. What, what happened to it? Is it? We had to send it back. Oh, God. Have you had any sense? No, no you still can't bring it in. Oh, God, I didn't realise that. Mm. It's a wine from Zimbabwe. Mm. 
So do you think that um, post-Brexit, do you think that would potentially have a positive impact on the wine market in the UK or do you not think consumers... Depends, or, depends on the tariffs, doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. I but I mean, at the end of the day, we're all going to be in the same boat in the train. So. No, no, sure. I think that's a very good point. As you said, it does quite simply for most people just boil down to price. Mm. And then, you know, how easy it's going to be for goods to move, you know, once we leave. Because alcohol, as you know, isn't the easiest of things to sell anyway. Mm. There's so many more extra laws and your yep. audience is obviously smaller because they have to be of a certain age, etc. And limits in terms of where you pick it up from. And terms. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, in terms of looking at it from the English wine industry's perspective, it, hopefully it might be quite a good thing if it, it, the attention is drawn to our island. In I don't think... It's, go on, go on. I don't, I don't think it'll make any difference to the English wine. I, I really don't. Um, in, in, why, sorry, why do you say that? What's, what's your uh, motivation for that? Because, I mean, the wine will still come in. Um, but what about the price point? I mean, I'm presuming that obviously the price point will go up for so any wine that's imported that might be more of a... Because people, you know, I think I've had this discussion with many, many people and, and we may have touched on it earlier that wine, I think, is incredibly underpriced for what it is. And I'm not saying it because I'm in the trade. <laughs> this is a really interesting <laughs> expression there. <laughs> no, but I've had this conversation with a lot of people and I think that... By the time you've picked it, you know, you've sourced it, you've bottled it, you've labelled it, you've shipped it. Oh, I agree. Kept, if, you know, for a £20 bottle, yeah. it, you know, a very small amount. Is goes, the wine. Yeah, I, I, we, we That's analyze, what I mean, sorry. By yeah, I, I we analyse this. And yeah. Actually, when you look at, say, a £7 bottle of wine, what the hell is the grower getting? Exactly. You know, with all of it. And this is where with the English stuff, yes, it is... Uh, priced up more. I mean, obviously, there, there is a, a shortfall in terms of um, the supply and demand, but it's, uh, I mean, you know, I, th I think wine in general is underpriced, but it's, uh, it's a very uh, hotly um, discussed topic. Now. Brexit, you think, get out, get on with it, and yeah. let, let's see what we do. Okay. I think, you know, we are very good. We built this company, country up on, you know, shipping stuff in from everywhere. Because we have to anyway, don't we? Being yeah. an island, it's just yeah, forward. absolutely. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, the next question I have for you, obviously, is uh, it's quite relevant to myself, but a lot of other people. There is a lot of young, what should we say, fresh talent coming into the oh, wine yeah, industry. True. You know, not not just uh, because of English wine, um, but just in general, there really is a, a huge drive for it at the minute. If it's possible for you to put into a nutshell everything you've learned. I mean, is there anything you would say, I really wish I knew about this at the start, or here's a great bit of advice for you to take away? Well, I mean, we do the circuit run on the universities when they come down. So what do you mean by that? Well, all the universities before they come to finish, they run this beauty thing. And we, we send people around to talk to the students well, well, they're just, just about qualified. What are they going to do afterwards? And uh, we've, we've got a hell of a lot of graduates in, in, the, in the system. And, um, you know, basically, you say to them, it's a fascinating wine, really is fascinating. And there's so many facets to it. But you're going to have to start. You're going to have to start on the shop floor. We will train you, which we do. Um, and... We get a hell of a lot of people, and we basically get, we probably got as many women managers as we have men, but they're, they're graduates. Yeah. Do you think most of them had any inkling before meeting any of your colleagues no, no, that no. they would do that? <laughs> no, no, I don't, don't think they have. The only problem with the women particularly, they get very good, they really are good at managing, and then they get to about 29, and off they go and have babies. <laughs> <laughs> which is damned because it, it costs you quite a bit to train them I it does mm. I did um, I was doing some reading on um, the the audiences for wine and as you touched on there it's I think there is a, a 
higher majority of women compared to the men who are actually into wine. Mm. And um, which I think is quite interesting because the actual wine trade itself seems to be the opposite. So, and I think from what I've noticed, uh, investigating all of this, is there are a lot more women in the trade now, and especially within the English wine industry. Um, I believe off the top of my head, it might be Barney, um, run by a lady. And then there's quite a few of them that they're starting up or that they're, they're progressing through. Mm -hmm. So, which, which is, which is brilliant. And I think it's, it's just great all around. Well, really. well, the old English wine merchant, they've, they've died out really. Mm. A, they can't afford to carry the stocks anymore. Um, uh, we've, we've got one I bought before I went, a phone called Leah Wheeler, which had been going for 150 years. What was it called, sorry? Lay and Wheeler. Okay. Um, it's a bit like the Corny and Barrows and the... And uh, that is run by a woman. So do you have, as, as we were discussing, with your stores, is there a majority female basis? I would say it's probably 60-40. Oh, really? As much as Yeah, that? I think so. Don't forget, I'm... I'm no longer chairman. I'm, of course, I yeah. got to seventy <clears throat> about fourteen years ago, and the city said you should retire. Uh, <laughs> and I said why, and they said, well, we don't like chairman over seventy-one, and we think younger people could come in. And although I still, I still am the biggest shareholder in Majestic, um, I basically haven't. I've been precluded from dealing with. You've relaxed a bit, shall we say, uh, well, taking your foot off the gas, maybe. Well, I keep watching it, but <laughs> <laughs> you're still guiding it. You just don't, just don't have well, to be there. You know, one of the, I think, one of the most fascinating things about wines, and thank you once again for showing us around Australia. That was really, really wonderful. Thank you. Is that there's there's so many stories behind a lot of the vineyards and the bottles, oh. and it's not a simply a product. It's no. not just something you buy. It's because there's so much passion drawn into the products themselves or the wines excuse me have you come across uh, any stories that have just blown you away or you know when you discussing earlier you'd go out and meet a lot of the, the guys at the vineyards and any come to mind well they were absolute particularly well i say i went 10 years running um for a week solid tasting which was <clears throat> you get back you i say you taste 1,300 wines during the day, during the week, and you get back to the hotel at night, your fingers were blue, your <laughs> lips were blue, your tongue was blue, and all you want to do is drink beer. But beer, really? Beer, oh yeah, you couldn't face another glass of wine. I can see that, wow. Um, but if the, conversely, Bordeaux, which is my love, um, you know, I've been to an awful lot of the chateaus over there, apart from working at Palmer. Uh, they are fascinating because they go back for years. And it's interesting to see some of them, how, if you, the Bible is called Cox and Ferret. Right. And that was years ago, and um, 1800 and something, before the classification in 1855. Um, and you can see how some of these vineyards of which were fantastic in those that have crashed, and how some others have come right up improved. I mean, Mouton is a classic case. It was never a first growth. It was a second growth. Why do you, why do you think that is? Why would, would some fail and others succeed? Uh, uh, I think Baron Philippe had a, an awful lot of money and <laughs> persuaded <Right>. them. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go back, um, one of the top, top wines for years came from... Um, the Rhone, um, Hermitage La Chapelle, okay. and that was more expensive than the feet. Right. Uh, it's a bloody good wine, but uh, it's no longer in that sort of league. What, I, what I'm finding really fascinating about this is how, you know, you've very clearly gone to these places and you've experienced them and you, you've drawn knowledge mm. from these people and obviously, most importantly, tried all of these wines. And that has very clearly stood you in well stead for mm. the rest of your career mm. now this i know is going to be tricky and we may have touched on this slightly earlier is there or are there any select few wines that really have just blown you away mm. <laughs> exactly 
Well, I was fortunate in the, I suppose, early 70s, when you could buy Chateau Petrus or Ch Chateau Le Pain for about £300 a case. Right. Now, or even Romani Conte for about £800 a case. Um, on the millennium, I had a dinner party here and I thought, right, I'm going to dish some really good wines up. So I paired Chateau Petrus 82 with Romani Conte 90 and the Romani Conte just blew it. Okay. It, it was so much better, you know, and the Parker gave Petrus 82 100, but I mean, it was not in the same league. Really? Oh, yeah. Not in the same league at all. And so you've, you've got the two grapes, you've got the Pinot Noir, and you've got the, you know, um, what's the name? But uh, there was no comparison with them. Do you think on an ordinary day, oh, excuse me, on an ordinary day, if you weren't, didn't, weren't comparing them side by side, the, you know, they both would have been. Oh, you would have thought both as blow your mind, but yeah, when yeah, you yeah. actually compare the two, then, you know, we followed it. We had Ekem, we had, uh, I, I, again, I had the Le Monche from DRC, which was mind-blowing. Um, every year, totally, when I was not in the wine trade, there were four couples, and I'd spend half a year planning it, and we would go, we went to Rioja, we went up the Dura Valley, we went up the Rhone, we went to... Um, Alsace, we went to Germany, uh, we went to Italy, and we went to all the top vineyards, and we had letters and introduction. And each night, it was normally for four days, one couple had to find the top restaurant okay. and book it and pay for it. <laughs> um, and of course, some of the best ones are in Burgundy. Yeah. You know, Paul Bacuse we went to, and you know, some of these fabulous things. But I learned a lot of what a lot about wine then. And then I remember going to Bone and meeting uh what I didn't know was the cellars under the houses didn't belong to the house. Oh really? No, some of these cellars are Roman and um I remember young Mr. Drow taking us down the cellars and it was someone else's house on top. <laughs> And we, with Gigal, uh, his cellars very, uh, go under the main road and everything else. They are um, Roman. So the cellars are that old, are they? Yeah, they're over 2,000 years old. Oh, wow. And are they just full of wine? Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, the temperature's perfect there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and particularly down the northern Rome where, you know... Uh, Condrio and all round there, these terribly small vineyards, very, very steep and uh, magnificent wine. They almost died out. What's coming next? You know, do you have many plans for the future? Are you <laughs> venturing off into anything, or I'm just very happy and uh, I'm going to sit uh, back? Because it I'm, sounds like you've got so much energy still. It's what I've really picked well, up. I'm from in you, my 84th year. 84th year. Yeah. So, no. <laughs> but I tell you what I'm I, happy <laughs> I, no I'm I'm in my office every morning at quarter past eight my office is the other side of where the cars are looking out over there I'm in there from eight quarter past eight every morning till one a quarter quarter to one sure um, doing all sorts of things I think that's the answer then you're just still cracking on keeping busy I've seen too many people who retire you know go and sit by the beach and six months later they're dead <laughs> <laughs> keep, keep working. I think you've got to have a reason to get up in the morning yeah, and I right. think you've got to get out of the house that's why before I retired it's got computers it's got television it's air conditioned it's got its own loo so you have a specific office space to go to yeah. sounds almost like a bunker you're, you're just set, set up in there <laughs> and my secretary who's worked for me over 30 years she comes in on the Monday Wednesday and Thursday Brilliant. so which is handy just one Final question. Thank you once again. No, no, it's pleasure. Been, been so wonderful. Any advice for myself? Obviously, in the wine trade now, set up my company, cracking on. 
is there any words of wisdom you could part with? Keep going. <laughs> Brilliant. I love that. That's exactly what I tend on doing. My heart's still ticking, quite literally. Yeah. So that's that's the point. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, keep going. <laughs>